Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Critical Issues Forum Online Teachers Workshop. Today, uh, we are going to give a lecture on the role of the United Nations in nuclear disarmament and non proliferation. This lecture will be given by Mr. John Dupree, the Senior Project Manager for Education and Training at the CNS. John has a uh, I already introduced him at the opening session, so I'm not going to talk about the details about his uh, uh, background, but John has uh, extensive experience in international non-proliferation uh, arena. So we are looking forward to this lecture. So now I'm going to give you the microphone to John. Thank you, Masako. Uh, and good day, everyone. I am going to talk to you um, during this next hour about the role of the United Nations in nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation. I have been fortunate in my career um, as both as a uh, national representative as, as well as an international civil servant to work very closely with the United Nations uh, in New York as well as in Geneva and Vienna. And so I, um, as a student, both high school as well as during my university years, I've become very passionate about the role of the United Nations. And I hope to share through you with your students uh, this passion. Um, the UN is the oldest international, one of the oldest international organizations that we have. And it was obviously um, the result of efforts by nations during the last few years of the Second World War uh, to prevent another world war from ever happening again. We also have to remember that the United Nations came as a result of the failure of the original League of Nations. And one of the key reasons why the League of Nations failed and what also led to the Second World War was the fact that the major powers in those days did not feel that they uh, were going to support uh, the League and, and not defend their national sovereignty. While the United Nations have been very successful over the years, we still have some of those elements that trouble the UN uh, today. So as far as what we call colloquially as the UN disarmament machinery. This is a loose group of bodies that um, operate in the disarmament field. Today, I'm only going to focus on the United Nations, um, which has various components, two separate components, the General Assembly and Security Council, and then the Secretariat will talk about the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva as well. Um, but I want to emphasize that there are several other non-United Nations bodies that operate under the sort of broader umbrella of the United Nations. And these are uh, first and foremost, the International Atomic Energy Agency that's in Vienna. And it's not a UN body. It has its own statute, its own rules, its own membership and its own funding. Um, but it is affiliated with the United Nations. We also have the Preparatory Commission for the CDBTO, which is also not a UN body, uh, but also operates um, under the UN umbrella. And then finally, Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. Um, this is a chemical weapons issue, not a nuclear issue, but this, this is an international organization created uh, by the Chemical Weapons Convention to oversee the implementation of the complete ban and prohibition of chemical weapons. So for today's talk, we'll focus on uh, the United Nations. We'll give a little background. We're gonna talk about how the General Assembly sets the agenda uh, for disarmament and especially in the nuclear field. We're gonna briefly look at two of its components. The first committee, there are six committees of the General Assembly. We're only gonna talk about the first one, um, a disarmament commission. And then we're going to look at various elements such as the Office of Disarmament Affairs, the Secretariat of the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research and the Secretary General's Advisory Board. Uh, we'll also touch on the Security Council and uh, the Conference of Disarmament, which is the negotiating forum. Firstly, 
It's important to look at the Charter of the United Nations. And one needs to understand that the United Nations uh, was not designed uh, in today's environment. If you look at the very first world words of the United Nations, it talks about we the peoples of the United Nations. Um, as uh, we are in the United States, um, those words also come right out of the uh, US Constitution, um, except that it says, we the people of these United States. The preamble reflects the time of um, when the UN was established to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. Um, so very much the fathers of the United Nations were focused on peace and security. And today, of course, we know the United Nations does far more than that. But um, if you read the charter, you will find that it is focused on maintaining international peace and security um, and to ensure by the acceptance of principles and the institution of methods that armed force shall not be used save in the common interest. So with that in mind, Article 1 of the Charter is very, very clear. To maintain international peace and security, take effective collective measures for the prevention and removal of threats to the peace. Um, interesting, if you look at Article 26 of the Charter, for instance, it actually talks about that the Security Council shall be responsible for maintaining international peace and that it should also establish a system of regulation of armaments. Now, while the Security Council has over the years taken many, many actions um, in the field of international peace and security, they never actually established a system of regulation of armaments. Um, and this is actually one of the shortcomings of the UN. The reason, of course, is that the security, the Charter of the United Nations um, was written and agreed to before the first nuclear explosion took place, which was obviously held in great secrecy. And so as a result of that, we have five countries with nuclear weapons that just so happened also to be the five permanent members of the Security Council. And they will not obviously subject their armaments uh, to the United Nations control. Very important that we need to understand when we talk about the United Nations, in particular in the field of uh, nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament, is that Chapter 7 of the UN Charter allows the Security Council to firstly determine whether there is a threat to peace and security and then to take measures uh, to address that threat. And since uh, acquisition of nuclear weapons is a major threat to international peace and security, the Council, as I will explain later on, have taken several measures in this regard. Most of these measures, measures are taken under Chapter 7. And that means that all countries, all nations that belong to the United Nations, whether they are on the Security Council or not, are legally bound to implement the decision by the Security Council. If not, they themselves could be, become the subject of sanctions. So Article 41 um, is the article, and although it does not use the word sanctions, but this is the article that the Security Council uses when it imposes sanctions against countries. It talks about uh, interruption of economic relations, rail, sea, air, post, telegraphic, radio, and other means of communications, and the severance of diplomatic relations. Bear in mind, this is language that was drafted in the, in the mid-40s. So some of this is no longer applicable. Um, but yet, this is the article that the Security Council used to impose economic and other types of sanctions against countries, especially in the field of um, weapons of mass destruction proliferation. Article 42, on the other hand, enables the Security Council to mandate the use of force. And um, it 
says so very clearly that it may take such action by air, sea, and land forces as may be necessary to maintain or restore international peace and security. An example of this was the um, the war uh, in Iraq and Kuwait in the early 90s, when the Security Council mandated the United States and a number of allied forces to take military action um, and to remove the invading Iraqi forces from Kuwait. Um, once those forces were removed, um, the United States and other troops withdrew from Iraq. Uh, they did not have the mandate to attack Iraq. Opposed to that, the um, attack on Iraq in 2003 under the auspices that Iraq had nuclear weapon program or other weapons of mass destruction was not mandated by the Security Council and therefore created um, quite a bit of a disruption in the region, uh, in the world, and it remains con controversial. Article 51 is also important. This is the article that countries often uh, refer to in that nothing in the Charter will impair the right of individual states to collective self-defense. Um, and so a state, obviously, if it is attacked or threatened, may take its actions until the Security Council has taken measures. Um, this, of course, is also a controversial article, especially when it comes to the acquisition of armaments, including weapons of mass destruction. Because obviously, if you acquire a nuclear weapon, um, it's the the pure uh, acquisition of such a weapon means that you threaten another country, um, and so is the right to acquire a nuclear weapon um, inherently um, implicit in Article Fifty One? Um, it clearly is not, um, but some countries have uh, argued that if they are threatened, they have the right to arm themselves. The case of North Korea, perhaps, could be used in this regard. All right, let's move on to the largest body, the main representative body of the United Nations. Um, the very first resolution adopted by the General Assembly um, of, of the UN, um, in, in accordance with Article 12 of the Charter, was, in fact, um, a resolution um, related to nuclear proliferation. And, of course, this was um, just after the U.S. Uh, tested and used nuclear weapons at the end of the Second World War. And the U.S. didn't want to have uh, these weapons spread further. Um, and so there was a resolution adopted that later on led to uh, the establishment of the IAEA. But the General Assembly, being the largest truly representative body in the, United, in, in the UN, have taken many decisions um, that uh, led to treaties and other important agreements. For instance, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty was endorsed by the General Assembly, not negotiated, but endorsed by the Treaty. The Biological Weapons Convention, the Chemical Weapons Convention, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organ. Uh, uh, treaty, the Terrorist Convention, the Arms Trade Treaty, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons was in fact negotiated inside the UN. Uh, it has also taken action on uh, illicit trafficking of small arms and light weapons. The General Assembly annually adopts uh, quite a large number of resolutions and decisions on non-proliferation, disarmament, arms control, and security. And these are recommended by one of its subcommittees. I'll talk about that shortly. Um, some of the uh, major organizations in the non-proliferation arms control field, the IAEA and the CTBTO and the OPCW, uh, make annual reports to the General Assembly. And then the General Assembly had three sessions on disarmament. Um, firstly, in 1978, member states, in particular those uh, from countries not aligned with the United States or NATO and the former Warsaw Pact countries, the Soviet Union, um, these states insisted that the 
the General Assembly need to have a special system to focus in particular on nuclear disarmament. Um, many of the agreements reached in those days have not yet been implemented, um, but it basically provides the framework of what we see today. Subsequent sessions were not successful in finding any out outcome uh, to, um, uh, to the issues, and today there's not even agreement to hold another session. The General Assembly can also make recommendations to the, generals, to the Security Council. Of course, as the largest body, um, it, uh, it is more representative, but the fact is, is the Security Council um, has the statutory powers to take a legally binding action, while the General Assembly can only make recommendations. So, the first committee of the General Assembly um, is called the Disarmament and International Security Committee. There are several other committees. We're not going to talk about those today. This committee exclusively deals with all disarmament, arms control, and non-proliferation issues. It meets in New York um, during October. It just concluded its work uh, a few weeks ago, and it adopts uh, quite a number of resolutions. I think this year, no fewer than 70 or so resolutions were adopted. While these are not legally binding, they typically set an international agenda on a particular issue. And so the uh, committee typically debates through a general exchange of views, then it focuses its discussions on particular views such as nuclear disarmament, and then resolutions are introduced and adopted. Unfortunately, many of these resolutions in the recent years have been just reintroduced um, without much change, and it gives the impression that the committee doesn't really make any uh, forward uh, progress. So once a resolution is adopted in the first committee, it goes to the General Assembly for final approval. So um, there's currently a very clear, and it's been going on for some time, a very clear um, divide between states, in particular on the issue of nuclear disarmament. Um, the majority of, of states um, are in favor of nuclear disarmament in one way or the other, while the nuclear weapon states um, and some of their allies uh, keep uh, pre preventing progress in this field. So the image uh, that you see is in fact a copy of um, a resolution adopted by the first committee. And you'll see that it's called the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which is a treaty that was um, negotiated and adopted in July of 2017. And so this resolution is an attempt by the sponsors listed there to um, get more countries to sign on to this treaty, in particular the states with nuclear weapons. Interesting to note that um, a lot of resolutions uh, get adopted without a vote. That is not means that there's consensus, it's just that there's no voting on them. Um, but other resolutions are adopted with votes, and that means that the states that vote against them don't feel uh, bound to them. So for purposes of your students, uh, you may want to refer to some of the um, links that I included here that will provide you access not only to the resolutions, but how countries voted, um, and some other background on, on the resolutions. Then there's a body called the Disarmament Commission. Uh, this is also a body that was established, in fact, um, in 1978 as a result of the special session on disarmament. And they meet, um, it's also open to all UN members. They meet uh, in New York uh, once a year. And they typically come up with a substantive document, uh, kind of a research or a research paper, if you wish, that uh, would give um, guidance on the particular issues. Um, again, they have been fraught with disagreement, um, even on very, very basic issues. Um, many years ago, the UN decided uh, that one of its topics of the UN Disarmament Commission should focus on the issue of nuclear weapons. And of course, that uh, created a, a major obstacle. Uh, the last time that they really came up with a, the, with a document was in 1999 um, on the guidelines to establish nuclear weapon free zones. These are zones completely free of nuclear weapons, uh, mostly in developing countries or countries of the South. 
Moving on to a deliberative body, uh, not a deliberative body, but a decision-making body. And this is the, called the Conference on Disarmament. The Conference on Disarmament is known as the Single Multilateral Disarmament Negotiating Forum. So, well, treaties can be negotiated in the General Assembly, as we have seen recently. Uh, traditionally, treaties such as the uh, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the Biological Weapons Convention, the Chemical Weapons Convention, and the, the uh, Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty were negotiated in the CD, the Conference on Disarmament. It's based in Vienna, it has 65 members, and it actually meets um, inside the chamber of uh, the former League of Nations, um, the equivalent of the Security Council of the, of the former League. Um, and so it is a UN-funded body, um, and the last time that it fully negotiated a treaty was the Chemical Weapons Convention in 93. It did also negotiate the Test Ban Treaty, but um, there was no consensus at the end, although the treaty um, was then open for signature. Um, it has been deadlocked, can you believe, since 1998. The members cannot agree on particular what is the best, the priorities for it uh, to negotiate, and it also gets stuck on some of the uh, substantive issues that they negotiate. Um, one of the key problems that the Conference on Disarmament has is that its rule says that everything must be taken by consensus. Of course, if you have 65 members and only one of them disagree, then you do not have consensus. Um, so it makes recommendations to the General Assembly and it meets, even though it has been deadlocked for so long, it actually meets um, from January to September, um, once a week, and countries then have the opportunity to exchange uh, views. Um, it also has a number of subcommittees. So pictures on the right is interesting. Um, this is the one on the top is the is actually the chamber where the conference and disarmament meets. The picture doesn't really do justice. It's a very beautiful hall, um, and inside are paintings, murals by. Um, a Spanish artist, Jose Maria Cert, um, that depicts um, the sort of development after the end of the uh, First World War, from destruction to, to um, development in the world. There is a very striking picture, though, um, as you know, the world again uh, elapsed into war. Um, interesting enough, uh, the same artist painted uh, for the, especially for the American teachers, um, the very, very impressive and beautiful uh, murals in the Rockefeller Center lobby in New York City. If ever you have an opportunity to visit either one of these places, uh, please do so. It is, it is uh, something that is quite memorable. So this is a list of the agenda items that the Conference on Disarmament is currently debating. You can see it ranges from um, an arms race, nuclear arms race and nuclear disarmament. They're trying to negotiate a treaty banning the production of all fissile material for nuclear weapons purposes. And they cannot find agreement on even how to negotiate it, let alone what the treaty should uh, or should not be doing. Um, then uh, prevention of nuclear war. This, of course, is a very wide treaty. Uh, prevention of an arms race in outer space, um, how to ensure states without nuclear weapons not to be threatened or by other states with nuclear weapons. How to, and this, is a, this one is new types of weapons of mass destruction and new systems of weapons. This is something that is um, of increasing concern, especially when you talk about autonomous type of weapons and other uh, weapons that um, even few years ago did not uh, exist, but that can cause uh, great disruption and, and um, um, death. Um, transparency, uh, etc. Right, that brings us to the Security Council. Again, the Security Council is mandated by the Charter with the, the prime responsibility to establish and maintain international peace and security. Security Council has five members, permanent members, with veto powers. That means 
that if any one of those five countries, China, France, Russia, the United Kingdom and the United States, votes against a resolution, vote against, they must physically raise their, their arm in the, in the chamber um, hall against the resolution, that means the resolution will not pass. There are 15 members of the council, and even if 14 of them agree, and one of these five disagrees by voting against, the resolution will not pass. The council also has 10 non-permanent members. These are elected by the General Assembly, and they rotate uh, on a two-year basis. And they, the rotation is staggered, so uh, five of them um, come in and then next year another five gets elected and so they get rotated. So currently uh, it's Belgium, Cote d'Ivoire, the Dominican Republic, Equatorial Guinea, Germany, Indonesia, Kuwait, Peru, Poland and South Africa. These members um, do not have veto power but um, they do uh, take decisions and influence discussions um, taken by the Security Council. While other United Nations members may participate, um, they may um, not vote. Um, and all resolutions under Chapter 7 taken by the Security Council are binding on all UN members. There's a very good link for you to also use in case you need more information on the Security Council. So here's a list, quite a comprehensive list and not uh, fully comprehensive of all the Security Council resolutions and actions taken in the field of non-proliferation. Um, I mentioned earlier the, the case of Iraq. Uh, the Security Council established actually a monitoring and verification inspection commission that was designed to work with the IEA to ensure that there are no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. The Security Council, even way back as 1993, started taking uh, action on, uh, against North Korea, given North concerns over North Korea's nuclear program, and many resolutions have subsequently been adopted. Um, shortly after the terrible attacks on 9-11-2001 in New York City, Washington DC, and in Pennsylvania, uh, the Security Council adopted uh, uh, several resolutions. It responded to the nuclear test by India and Pakistan. Um, it um, made also um, some presidential statements. These are not legally binding, but they are statements that are quite powerful. One of the resolutions that is clearly um, a way or an example of how the Security Council change how states operate in the field of weapons of mass destruction. There's a resolution with a number of 1540, and this is aimed at the non-proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, particularly to prevent weapons of mass destruction and materials related to them uh, to fall in the hand of terrorists. Um, most notably, the Security Council in uh, 2006 adopted a resolution in which it expressed serious concern about the fact that the IEA could not provide assurances about Iran's undeclared nuclear material and activities. And subsequently, the Security Council has adopted 10 additional resolutions on Iran's nuclear program. So to uh, conclude our first part of the, of the talk, I just want to also refer to um, some high-level activities that have been taking place at the UN. This is very, very high-level decisions. These are not binding decisions, um, but these are decisions that kind of set uh, the, the agenda um, for for the United Nations, but also through from the United Nations through its member states. So, firstly, in 2003, the Secretary General appointed a high-level panel, um, and in um, uh, 2005, it issued he issued a report called "Enlarger Freedom" um, to the World Summit 2005, and you can see many of the. Um, items that are listed there are issues that are still not being implemented. Um, so the 
General Assembly or the, the UN called for nuclear weapon states to be committed to disarmament under the NPT. Uh, they called for strengthening the IEA's ability to verify states' uh, peaceful nuclear activities. Uh, they called for the ratification and entry into force of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Um, and they expressed um, concern over the fact that the NPT is in a precarious state. Now, this is 2005. The NPT uh, will see its review conference next year in 2020. And the word precarious doesn't do justice of explaining how uh, deep and troubled the treaty is. Just this year, um, the Secretary General Antonio Guterres announced uh, on a, a, an agenda for disarmament for 2019. He announced it actually last year. It is a very comprehensive document on practical measures across the entire range of disarmament issues, starting with weapons of mass destruction, conventional arms, and especially future weapon technologies. And it is aimed at providing a fresh perspective and explore areas where dialogue is required to bring this element back to the mainstream agenda. As you can imagine, um, the issue of climate change is, is a mainstream agenda for the uh, UN. And while, as I mentioned right from the outset of my talk, uh, the UN was born out of the ashes of the Second World War, and disarmament has always been um, a mainstream if, uh, issue, especially if you look and um, interpret the charter. It no longer is as high a priority, it seems, for the members of the UN as climate change is. Um, and there's obviously not a competition between the two. I explained in a previous lecture that the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists uh, just uh, in January of this year, moved their symbolic clock to two minutes to midnight, uh, based on their fears that the issue of climate change and nuclear war um, and nuclear proliferation brings the world closer to a doomsday scenario. So part of the new agenda for disarmament set by the Secretary General uh, talks about comprehensive disarmament, uh, recognize that there's an inter international malaise um, and that there's a, a new Cold War that is uh, starting. It is calling for uh, a norm against the, the use of nuclear weapons. A very famous phrase that is uh, included in this agenda is a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. This is a phrase used um, by the United States and, and Russia in, in the days of President, President Reagan and, and Secretary Gorbachev. Um, if there's a, a good phrase for your students to, to capture and to embrace, it would be this one. It also recognizes that um, there are several challenges that face the UN. Um, and eliminating weapons destruction, mass destruction is, is key in this. Um, also recognizing that um, given the destructive power, especially of nuclear weapons, that civilians continue to bear the brunt of armed conflict. Very important, the UN adopted a series of development goals and weapons development, um, actually take funds away from, from uh, developing uh, the socioeconomic infrastructure of states. It calls for political dialogue and negotiations. Uh, it recognizes that new technologies today could, could lead to the creation of cyber weapons of mass destruction, uh, which could even be more dangerous than, than nuclear weapons. And then finally, um, and very importantly, the new agenda from, by the Secretary General calls for partnerships uh, between actors with a stake in disarmament, including the private industry and the um, private sector. So with that, um, and I, and I uh, encourage you to um, maybe 
provide your students with access to this agenda because it contains valuable information. Um, but I will take a quick break and then we will come back and we'll look more at what the Secretary of the United Nations is doing. Thank you. <laughs> 